Hi everyone, it's your boy Zach and this is my review of The Ambassadors number one. As always, look, I paid for it. This is me reading it in uh, Kindle. Or this is just proof that I paid for it. Here's where I actually read the thing. So there's this weird kind of uh, liminal space between when I buy the book and when the pirates upload it and I actually read it. Because this is how I like to read a digital comic like this. And I can't find a similar option on the Kindle reader. But before I start, first kill graphic novel. We have crossed 190,000. 200,000 is well within reach right now. This book's about to start getting lettered. A lot of work is getting done, and I owe it all to the Freedom app. I remember back in the day when uh, Joe Mad and J. Scott Campbell, they had their books over there at Wildstorm, but they would just get more and more late, and people were like, oh, they're just playing video games all the time. Well, it turns out that was true for Joe Mad. But J. Scott Campbell was like, I was into video games for like two and a half months. No, I just had a lot of deals. I had statues, posters, a cartoon, a video game, action figures. I was just always in meetings. But there's all sorts of distractions. And no, this is not a paid endorsement. But basically, I will look at how much time I wasted just doing kind of nothing. And then I will say, I just wasted three hours. So now let me block myself from all the apps for three hours except for like phone in case of emergency. So that's why all these books are finally coming out. Oh, speaking of which, nice segue. Is it a segue though if it's accidental? I don't think it is. So there's a lot more to this picture than you would think. On the surface, it just looks like a comic, a graphic novel, two pinups, a pistol, a knife, and a Funko Pop right here. But this was a journey. I think for every single book except for Pandemic, there has been a French folded pinup. And I absolutely love doing this. It's actually one of my favorite things. And they got a new postal inspector in the area where the fulfillment center is. And the new postal inspector, first he was saying that, okay, graphic novels qualify, but floppies don't. Then we spent about a month proving to him that yes, floppies qualify because they have an ISBN barcode, they don't have advertising. He goes, okay, fine, you convinced me, but the pinups don't count. So then we had to go through that again to prove that the pinups count as marketing material, which can be mailed along with media mail. So I'm ecstatic that we keep getting to have the pinups along with the books. And this guy sent a picture of Knife Hand along with his books. And this guy actually refurbished this K-Bar. This is some uh, ancient rust, and it gives it a very nice texture. So Mark Millar is really going through a renaissance in his career. Uh, I believe he has like five books out. Unfortunately for me, I don't like vampires. I don't like magic. <laughs> so that kind of takes half of them off the table. I do like Nemesis, and I absolutely love this book. So this is The Ambassador's. It is, I believe, a six-issue miniseries, a different superstar artist for every single issue. And, uh, wow, they got the highlights in her eyes done very well. I had a whole conversation yesterday about highlights in the eyes with a colorist. So this first issue is by Mark Millar and Frank Quitely. And I flipped through it when I saw it on Kindle, and I was like, oh, man, this is really good. The colors are amazing. And then I checked the credits. And it turns out that Frank Quitely also was the colorist. This is the first rendition of Mexico that I have seen in a decade that didn't have the Mexico filter on it. You know that sepia quality, like somehow Mexico is eternally stuck in the 1880s. <laughs> so Mark Millar has a Netflix deal and he has been working on various screenplays. And you really see it in the opening. This actually feels, and this is in the best way, like the opening scene of a streaming show that's just really going to grab your attention. So you have the shopkeeper. This scene is from the 1980s in Mexico. I almost want to call shenanigans on the soda machine. This looks to me more like a soda machine from Japan. But I don't know. I don't know. Maybe. So anyway, this weird experimental creature just pops up, breaks in, starts drinking the sodas. And then he levitates a truck that almost landed on top of him. 
First scenes are very important, and from the first scene, I was like, oh, it's not just going to be the same old thing. This is actually really high quality, intriguing. Then we get a glimpse of this mysterious island. This is actually a huge thing right now, especially in the Middle East and the South China Sea. China actually took this reef in the South China Sea, but not in their own territorial waters. And over almost 20 years, they took a bare reef, reclaimed some soil and some square footage, and now they have a whole ass freaking military base built. And it's called Mischief Reef, and they're literally up to mischief. So when I see things from the real world in, I guess this would be more science fiction than superheroes, it's very compelling to me. So then we start getting the history of this world, which seems to be an original world. It's not the same world as Jupiter's legacy, as far as I know. And they're talking about during the Cold War, America was trying to fake the funk and make the Soviets think we had our own Superman. But it didn't look that great, so they just kind of gave up on it. But now there are real life superheroes. This is a woman from South Korea who's actually in jail but developed this superhero process, and instead of selling it to the military or commodifying it somehow, she says she's just going to give it away to essentially good people. So just as far as a premise and the scenes in just this first issue, I'm totally on board. I'm very, very excited about it. One of the strangest things about SJWs in comics is how they are not embarrassed by failure. It seems to not affect them at all in a way that is inhuman. One of the things that's so interesting to me about Mark Millar right now is that he doesn't have to do this. As far as I know, his job is just to work at Netflix, to come up with ideas for shows. They don't have to put out a comic to justify the show. They can just put the show into development. So the risk versus reward is actually fairly unfavorable. Especially if you're gonna put out like five books it's really easy for them to underperform, for people to not care. But if you watch Thinking Critical, like every single month when they mention the best books of the month, Mark's new books will be on there. And with the shrunken readership, with all the issues in the comic book industry, Mark is literally returning to comics at the most inopportune time. I think most people would look at this and say, nah, just skip that shit. <laughs> And he's come back in a very definitive way. So I'm very excited about this miniseries. And thank God there's no magic in it because I hate that shit. <laughs> to me, vampires are still magic. Even if you give them some sort of realistic explanation, they're magic. Just don't even, just, they're magic. Stop it. So anyway, before I go, first kill graphic novel, link is in the description. Thanks for watching. Bye.